So yes, welcome everyone. Thank you for, for joining us this evening for um, what is the first in a new series of RBMO live broadcasts um, um, from, uh, from this platform. And uh, it's, it's great, great to welcome you. Um, we've put together what I believe is a, 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 an eclectic and interesting uh, program for you this evening. Um, but I think before, before we get into that and uh, I introduce Juan, um, just to tell you a little bit about the, the journal. Um, I, I hope most of you will know of RBMO. It's been around for almost 25 years now. Uh, Juan and I have um, been taken over as co-chief editors just over a year ago, and we work with a fantastic team of editors, section editors, who I hope are joining us tonight, many of you. Um, our reviewers, who, of course, hugely valued, and uh, I hope many of you are with us this evening. And, of course, our back office staff. And we're a, quite a unique journal, I believe, in the field because we are not associated with a particular uh, society. We have links with a number of societies around the world, and we like that way of operating. It gives us a real global reach. And I think that in the years since Bob Edwards founded the journal, it's established itself uh, as being quite well known as um, quite progressive journal, sometimes introducing new ideas, sometimes a little bit uh, provocative, edgy. That's what we need in science. But at the same time, making sure that the science is published is of high quality and published at a high level. So um, that is a little bit about our journal. Um, the, um, the, this webinar is really one of a number of ways we're trying to reach out to the science community. Um, many of you will become aware over the last year of the work we've been doing in social media. Uh, and those of you who aren't following us on social media, particularly LinkedIn and Twitter, please do. There's an awful lot going on with our insights and our digest, uh, which we put together every month. Uh, and, and, and I think, uh, I hope you'll agree, are, are, are useful uh, to read. So um, here we are, Juan and I. I don't think that Juan really needs an introduction. He's extremely... Uh, well known the world over as a leading clinical scientist in our in our field, but he's um, the medical director of uh, IVI RMA and chief scientific officer of IVI RMA Global. He's a professor of obstetrics gynecology in Madrid University, and of course works with me as co-editor in the chief uh, in chief of RBMO. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Nick, and and I think if there's someone in the reproductive field that doesn't need that introduction is you. So I think everyone uh, joining us together, I see we're 450 people right now, uh, know uh, Nick. Nick Macron is a group medical director of London Women's Clinic in London, um, also director of the London Egg Bank, London Sperm Bank. He has held full professorships and departmental chair positions at the universities of Utrecht and Southampton and Copenhagen. As a former member of ESRE Executive Committee and coordinator of ESRE SIG in Reproductive Endocrinology and now uh, co-chief editor of RBMO, it's a real pleasure to work with him. And, and we're happy to be back with a new RBO, RBMO webinar tonight. Um, I think we have very exciting topics. Um, you can find actually the previous RBMO webinars on, on the i3 website. You can click on ibfmeeting.com if you want to check them. For those joining us tonight, uh, there will be certificates of attendance that will be posted in a few days. So uh, not immediately, but just uh, be patient. Um, they will come. Um, yeah, and also uh, just um, housekeeping things. Um, for the questions tonight, please uh, put your questions uh, to the speakers in the Q&A section. There's a Q&A section that you can find easily. Uh, don't use the chat for the questions, but please use the chat uh, to take part in the discussion. So we will be uh, monitoring both our team will be monitoring the Q&A section and the chat uh, uh, for, for following the meeting. Um, so, well, I think that's enough for the introduction. I think we can uh, start with the first speaker. And I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Greta Termisoni, a skilled uh, clinical embryologist with a large experience since uh, 2017. She's actually senior clinical embryologist at Genera Clinica Valle Giulia which is part of the Genera IVR, EVRMA group in Rome, in Italy, and she has uh, consistently demonstrated a special dedication to clinical embryology research. Greta's talk tonight will be based on a very recent paper that she just published on, uh, actually the title is Effect of Ejaculatory Abstinence Period on Fertilization and Clinical Outcomes in ICSI Cycles, a Retrospective Analysis of 6,919 Cycles. So please, Greta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for um, your introduction. 
Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me. Uh, for me, um, I'm honored to be here with you to present and discuss the um, result of um, this paper aimed to um, evaluate the effect of ejaculatory abstinence period on fertilization and clinical outcomes in ICSI cycles. Um, this retrospective study was conducted um, at the Centro Scienze della Natalità uh, of San Raffaele Institute uh, in Milan, in Italy, where I work as a um, clinical embryologist uh, until a few months ago. And uh, I'm very happy to share we, with you this last uh, achievement. And um, let me start with some uh, small back, um, uh, background information. And the semen sample was, um, and the, the semen analysis was the, the first step of the uh, male uh, diagnostic uh, process. And one of the factors that can uh, influence the um, uh, bi biological quality of the semen sample was the ejaculatory abstinence period. And uh, as we um, aware, the WHO guidelines recommend uh, from two to seven days of ejaculatory abstinence before the seminal fluid examination, while the HRA special interest group of andrology advise three or four days prior to semen analysis. And um, tens of scientific papers uh, um, was published and several meta-analyses uh, uh, was published uh, aimed to evaluate uh, the association between uh, this factor with the high VF outcomes, but uh, we know a uh, real uh, consensus. And um, uh, a great challenge uh, in reaching uh, um, a consensus, uh, in my opinion, is the heterogeneity of the subject, the procedures, the time window examined. Um, for example, uh, uh, recently, um, there is a lot of interest in a short and very short uh, uh, ejaculatory abstinence period. And last but not least, uh, the outcomes uh, that um, um, taken in, uh, into consideration. So for this reason to date, there are uh, no evidence-based recommendations regarding the standardized optimal period of sexual abstinence between two uh, and seven days prior to ICSI treatment of infertile couples. Um, due to the complexity of uh, the IVF process and <coughs> the development, the, we chose to focus our research on fertilization uh, outcome. And uh, this uh, primary outcome allows a simple and reliable evaluation to uncover a subtle variation uh, regarding the ejaculatory uh, abstinence period, which might be masked in the later uh, steps. And this is the flow chart of uh, um, cycle inclusion. And uh, um, as you can see, uh, all ICSI procedures uh, with the fresh and non-donor gametes uh, were uh, included. Cycles with um, PGTSR uh, treatment and the cycle with uh, semen with uh, uh, days of ejaculatory abstinence period less than two or greater than seven, and cycle with uh, um, at least one zygote with more than three pronuclei were excluded for a total of uh, uh, about uh, 7,000 cycles. The primary outcome was the fertilization pattern, um, particularly 1PN, 2PN, 3PN zygote rate based on the total number of inseminated oocytes. And uh, the secondary outcomes uh, was um, the embryological ones. Uh, such as uh, blastulation rate and top quality blastulation rate and the clinical outcome 
such as uh, the cumulative pregnancy rate and cumulative clinical pregnancy rate. Um, now I would like to go on to illustrate some technical and uh, methodological aspect uh, of the study. Um, whole semen sample were prepared with uh, density gradient media and the uh, fertilization uh, pattern was assessed with uh, static observation in uh, uh, the optimal time window. One P and zygote were maintained in culture until day three and uh, uh, three P and zygote were discarded. And how about the statistical analysis, the relationship between the ejaculatory abstinence and fertilization were evaluated by multivariable analysis, including all possible confounders. So now it's, let's go to, to the results. This uh, table uh, summarizes baseline male um, uh, characteristic and uh, semen, semen sample characteristics uh, um, according to the ejaculatory abstinence uh, period in uh, the descriptive group of two, three, four, and uh, five to seven days uh, of abstinence. Regarding the semen parameters, we found uh, significant differences in terms of both uh, semen sample volume and sperm concentration according to the ejaculatory abstinence days. So as you can see, group with uh, a more extended abstinence period, uh, period had uh, higher mean volume and uh, sperm concentration value when compared with male with um, a lower ejaculatory abstinence. Uh, and additionally, we also found uh, a significant reduction in total progressive motility for higher ejaculatory abstinence days categories. And um, so the total uh, motile sperm count was found be, to be significantly different between categories with higher values for the five to seven days group when compared to the two group, two day groups. In addition, uh, it's worth noting how the distribution of the paternal age was significantly different among groups. And um, it is higher in the group of five to seven days. Similarly, the group with uh, five, to se five to seven days of ejaculatory abstinence also showed the highest mean value of maternal age. Uh, I thought this uh, difference uh, was not statistically significant for the continuous data. However, as you can see below the, the same group, show an increase in infertility causes related to the maternal age. While no differences were um, reported to the distribution of the other female infertility factors. In addition, uh, looking down the, down the slide, severe male fertility factor are similar in all study groups. Now we come uh, to the main result of the study. The fertilization rate uh, for the total amount of about 40,000 inseminated oocytes is uh, in a, about uh, 7,000 cycles. And um, in this table, in this table, it has uh, been reported the number of 1PN, 2PN, and 3PN zygote and uh, the relative rate. And um, it is important to note that uh, the 1PN, 2PN, and 3PN rate is uh, in line with the literature data. The um, effect uh, was adjusted for uh, several uh, confounding factors, about uh, 
couple characteristics and uh, cycle characteristics. For example, uh, maternal age, paternal age, uh, total motile sperm count, uh, and uh, length of, st of uh, stimulation. Um, but um, if you wish, you can uh, read them uh, um, in the slide. And uh, as you can see here in the, in the slide, uh, no association was found uh, between the 1P and zygote rate and the uh, ejaculatory abstinence uh, period. Um, on the other end, both uh, 2PN zygote rate and 3PN zygote rate uh, was uh, significantly different in the group. Um, for, um, for each additional day of abstinence, the odds of having whole 2PN zygote on all inseminated oocytes decreased by 3%. And, um, for every passing day of ejaculatory abstinence, the odds of having whole 3 pn zygote out of the total number of inseminated oocytes decreased significantly by 14%. What about the secondary outcomes? Uh, we found no association between uh, blastulation rate for cycle and top quality blastulation rate for cycle um, in about uh, 4,000 uh, blastocyst cultures and cycles. And um, the same uh, no association was uh, observed in uh, between the clinical outcome and the uh, ejaculatory abstinence period. In terms of cumulative uh, pregnancy rate, cumulative clinical pregnancy rate, and uh, miscarriage rate. Um, in summary, um, as the period of ejaculatory abstinence uh, increase, we observe a significantly uh, a significant uh, higher semen volume, sperm concentration, and uh, total motile count. And uh, these data are in line with the three recent uh, uh, meta-analyses published on this topic. Uh, on the contrary, we observe a significant decrease of the sperm total progressive motility, and uh, the literature evidence uh, is uh, inconclusive. In at this moment, and um, what about uh, uh, the um, fertiliz fertilization outcome? Uh, the spermatozoa seems to be less competent in achieving the a successful fertilization, and um, with a consequent reduction in uh, usable uh, oocyte if you discard. Uh, uh, 3PN zygote, for example. And the literature evidence about the 2PN uh, zygote rate is uh, inconclusive, um, while uh, the um, data about abnormal fer fertilization is uh, totally missing. Um, mm, further uh, statistical analysis, uh, um, goes to the um, interesting results uh, about the um, relationship between the ejaculatory abstinence, total motile count, and uh, 3PN zygote uh, rate. In, in particular, the um, univariate analysis uh, showed a significant uh, relationship between the ejaculatory abstinence period and 3PN zygote rate, and um, also for the uh, relationship between the total motile sperm count and the 3PN zygote rate. But the um, multivariable uh, model um, show uh, 
uh, significant uh, relationship uh, between the ejaculatory abstinence period uh, um, with the 3 pn zygote rate, uh, regardless of the total motile sperm count, uh, because uh, this relationship, uh, uh, there is no association between the total motile sperm count and 3 pn in the multivariable uh, model. So the, this uh, analysis suggests that uh, total motile uh, count parameters differs according to the ejaculatory abstinence, but um, it is not a mediator of the possible effect of the ejaculatory abstinence period on the 3PN zygote rate. And uh, we speculate that the increase in abstinence days affect other seminal characteristics that can uh, contribute to a higher rate of abnormal fertilization. Um, but what could be the what could be the, the mediator or the cause the cause of uh, this effect? Um, it is well known that uh, a three pn zygote in its cycles can be produced as a result of uh, the entry of a diploid spermatozoa, or um, um, of the presence of diploid maternal chromosome set, or um, or the fail uh, to extrude the second polar body. But um, we now know that uh, the emission of the second polar body was observed in the vast majority of the 3PN zygote. Um, and uh, this event, uh, now we know that uh, is uh, less frequent than we expected uh, because of the thanks to the, to the time-lapse uh, observation published in a, a recent uh, paper published on uh, human reproduction. And um, of course, there are uh, a main contribution, uh, maternal contribution, um, of course, uh, for um, uh, that can pl place and uh, uh, can be a, uh, a pivotal role in uh, the um, uh, abnormal fertilization, and uh, in this study we can uh, we can try to to take uh, account of these uh, um, regardless the ovarian stimulation maternal maternal age, for example. But uh, uh, we cannot exclude uh, a paternal contribution to the uh, formation of abnormal fertilization because uh, the um, uh, extended and uh, prolonged uh, um, um, abstinence uh, could be a detrimental uh, effect uh, in the seminal microenvironment, for example, and um, this uh, could be a detrimental for um, sperm cell and uh, their competence. Moving uh, to the conclusion, I want to underline the strength and limitation of uh, this um, study. Uh, to the best of uh, our knowledge, the, uh, this study was the first study analyzing the um, phenomena of fertilization in the cycle with a focus on abnormal fertilization pattern. The study population is a large population over a long time frame and uh, with a wide range of uh, semen quality. The statistical models uh, applied uh, um, was a quasi-binomial distribution to better estimate the proportions as a responses variable. And um, the, um, one of the best measure of the IVF treatment uh, success uh, was reported uh, as a cumulative pregnancy rate. Of course, uh, this study has uh, some limitation of course, uh, this is a single center uh, study with uh, a retrospective design. And um, the 
the fertilization pattern was uh, assessed with uh, aesthetic uh, observation without uh, time lapse uh, imaging technology. And um, in conclusion, um, these data suggest that the abstinence period strongly influences the fertilization phenomenon, if only with a minor effect, suggesting its possible impact not only on seminal parameters, but uh, also in terms of sperm uh, competence. And um, in the other hand, uh, ejaculatory abstinence the, seems not to be associated with uh, any later effects uh, regarding embryological or clinical uh, outcomes. Um, as you, as uh, we already mentioned, the major criticism was the static observation of uh, the fertilization uh, pattern. And um, to confirm the reproducibility of this observation in a different setting, uh, on my first day of work in Rome, I went to Danilo Cimadomo and I asked him if I could look at this data uh, in the general lab and clinical setting in a retrospective way. And then the new setting um, was uh, characterized by whole ICSI cycles uh, with uh, uh, semen sample preparation with uh, swim up technique, um, blastocyst culture in uh, continuous data, and um, uh, over 80% of PGTA cycles. These preliminary data were. Uh, submitted to hash meeting in 2024 and we are waiting for the response. Uh, we are uh, at the end of my presentation and I want to thanks uh, a lot uh, my staff of uh, Sarafelli Institute and uh, particularly Luca Pagliardini, uh, Alessandra Alteri, uh, Enrico Papaleo and Elisa Ravellotti. And uh, I thank, uh, uh, of course, uh, my new group uh, of uh, General Eve RMA and uh, all of uh, us for uh, your attention. Well, thank you very much, Greta, for that very clear presentation of this very interesting paper, which I think is going to be influencing practice. Um, we're going to be uh, discussing this in the Q&A section. I'm delighted to see we've had a lot of very interesting questions coming through. But perhaps if I could ask one before we move to our next speaker, Greta. Um, you, you had quite a, a, a broad definition, I suppose, of patients who were coming for ICSI up to 10 million. A question here from Geraldine Emerson from the UAE is, why, why did you select the cutoff of 10 million, And did, given it's for ICSI? And if you would analyze the effect of abstinence at, at more extreme measures of uh, uh, OAT, did you see the same results irrespective of that, uh, the, the degree of OAT? But the, this is not a, a limit of the semen sample, but um, um, in the slide you can uh, you can see this value because uh, um, it is the um, mean of the of the value of the um, the semen sample that uh, we we have included in our study. In the study, okay, so yes. it might be from the, the one interquartile of the population. Yes. And have you introduced this? Has this changed your practice in your clinics, this study? Yes. Yes. But uh, um, the, the WHO guideline recommends uh, uh, from two to seven days. And so um, this, uh, this data is uh, not so strong to uh, change uh, our clinical uh, um, practice. Yes, because although it's statistically significant, perhaps clinically the impact is yeah. yes, not so big. So would you say yeah. that if, if in, in general the, the way we might interpret the study would be that we can offer that flexibility? 
to patients between two and seven? Oh, yes, for, for yeah. sure, yes. Uh, it could be uh, a good point. Um, I think that uh, um, the abstinence period could be a um, small piece of uh, the puzzle of yeah. uh, the mm, many, many things that we can do to mm, uh, improve uh, our yeah. treatment. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for presenting that. And you, uh, as, as uh, we've said in the chat, the paper is, it has been published in RBMO for those of you who would like to go and read thank it. You. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you. Uh, thank we'll, you. We'll ask you back later for the Q&A. Uh, we'll look yes. forward to seeing that. Thank so you. Um, we're going to move now to our second speaker, um, a, a very well-known name to many of you, uh, a pioneer in the field of reproductive genetics, Professor Dayton Wells. Um, he's been involved in pre-implantation -gen pre genetic testing and study of gametes and embryos for a long time. Um, it says here three decades, difficult to believe when you look at him. But um, throughout his career, uh, he has pioneered the application of advanced methodologies. And those that uh, many of us are using around the world come from his, uh, his research. He's now a professor of reproductive genetics at the University of Oxford. He's current president of uh, the Pre-Implantation Genetic Diagnosis International Society, which I'm very pleased to say is one of our affiliated uh, societies at RBMO. And he's chair of the ASRM PGT Special Interest Group. So Dagan joins us tonight to call, talk about his recent paper published in our RBMO that's entitled Oocyte Rescue, In Vitro Maturation Does Not Adversely Affect Chromosome Segregation during the first meiotic division. Welcome, Dagan, and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Nick, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, first of all, right off the bat, I must say, this really isn't my study, despite being uh, the senior author on it. This is very much the study of Marga Esbert from Evie Barcelona, uh, <clears throat> and she was to have given this presentation today, but wasn't able to. So I'm stepping in for her. I apologize in advance for not being anything like the embryologist that she is. And so while I will be able to answer your genetic questions, I might struggle a bit with some of the embryological ones, but I will try my best. Um, so uh, getting straight into it, I guess one of the things we can think about is that the oocyte in many respects, I know we've just seen a very uh, useful presentation on sperm, but I would contend that the oocyte in many respects is the main determinant of early embryo viability. Of course, it's contributing one of the parental genomes, the maternal genome, but it's so much more than that, of course. It's contributing the mitochondria and many resources, RNAs, proteins, which are being stored there and which the embryo will need during the first few days of life. Consider, of course, that the embryo doesn't even express its own genome until it's probably around the four to eight cell stage. And so those early mitoses really have to go on dependent on what the egg has provided. The quality of that egg is going to be key in the embryo making it through those first few divisions. And that's affected, of course, by many different things. But a couple of important parts of that equation are the follicular microenvironment and the signals that the, uh, that the egg is receiving whilst it's in the follicle. And of course, the, both of these are greatly affected by the cumulus cells that surround and support the egg as it's maturing and developing. Uh, the, they have an extremely intimate association with the egg, not only are they right next to it and sharing that same microenvironment, but of course they have transonal projections, these cytoplasmic filaments that pierce through the zona pellucida and connect with the cytoplasm of the egg via gap junctions. This allows the cumulus cells to mediate communication with the external environment, including uh, transducing signals from hormones and so forth, uh, but also to transfer small molecules. And these include some quite important ones, including things like cyclic AMP, uh, but also energy sources like pyru pyruvate and phosphocreatine. So uh, these are obviously absolutely essential in the development of a competent oocyte. Now, of course, when we retrieve eggs from the ovary, uh, we hope to find nice ones looking like this image here, a mature 
meiosis II egg. But while this is the majority of eggs, about 15 to 20% of those that are retrieved are not mature. They're at earlier meiotic stages, either the germinal vesicle stage or uh, in meiosis one. So these are immature eggs. And of course, we've seen this ever since the beginning of IVF really. And there's been a long interest in the possibility of maturing these uh, immature eggs, uh, carrying them through to meiosis two, at which point you could consider fertilizing them, producing embryos, and hopefully therefore having more material for your patient to work with uh, and a greater chance of achieving a pregnancy. At least that would be the hope. But the reality is that this kind of in vitro maturation hasn't worked very well thus far. Maturation rates are typically in the order of maybe 40 up to 85%. Uh, 85% doesn't sound too bad, but actually um, most studies fall well short of that. And what, even once uh, a mature egg is produced and fertilized, uh, you tend to see that outcomes are not as good uh, with the embryos produced. Fertilization rates are lower, embryo development is poorer, pregnancy rates not so good when compared to eggs that were mature at the time of retrieval from the ovary. So why the poorer outcomes from in vitro matured eggs? Well, it could be due to deficiencies of the cytoplasm. Maybe those eggs are not as well resourced as they ought to be. The other possibility, of course, is that there's a problem with chromosome segregation. Maybe IVM oocytes have higher levels of aneuploidy. And there is some evidence for that from both murine and human studies. And of course, we know that when you have an aneuploid egg, then you have an aneuploid embryo. And recent studies have shown that when you do have an aneuploid embryo, I'm not talking about mosaic embryos here, I'm talking about a meiotic aneuploidy and therefore present in all the cells of the embryo, this is almost always lethal to the embryo. It's not likely to produce a viable uh, pregnancy. So clearly that's very important. And if there were high levels of aneuploidy in IVM oocytes, that could be an important explanation for why they generally don't do as well. I just here's again some data from the literature just showing uh, the reduced uh, fertilization rates, blastulation rates, uh, and the chromosome normality or euploidy rates that have sometimes been reported. So the objectives of this particular study led by Margaret Esbert was to compare the aneuploidy rates that we saw in in vitro matured oocytes with those that were mature at the time of retrieval. Uh, and you might think that, well, this doesn't sound particularly novel uh, and there must be a ton of data on this. But actually, surprisingly, the literature is relatively poor, at least in terms of using modern technologies, high accuracy, looking at all of the chromosomes, to actually determine what the differences might be. We also wanted to know whether this kind of rescue IVM, the discovery upon retrieval of an immature egg and the attempt to rescue it by maturing it in vitro, whether that could actually impact the fidelity of meiotic chromosome segregation. Could it leave us with more aneuploidy? We also wanted to know whether the addition of cumulus cells to this in vitro maturation attempt uh, could Im improve the maturation rates. If we added cumulus cells from the patient into that culture media, could we help things along? And could this also help to reduce the aneuploidy rate? So this was the study design. It was a prospective study carried out at EV Barcelona in Spain. It had all the necessary ethical approvals. There were 95 oocyte donors. So this was all focused on oocyte donors rather than infertile couples and rather than patients. Um, and these had no known fertility problem. They were between 18 and 35 years of age, but the mean was just about 25. Um, they had BMIs in the normal kind of range. They were shown to be karyotypically normal and uh, had, according to ultrasound, nor normal uh, uterus and ovaries. Uh, patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome and, or a history of chemotherapy and radiotherapy were excluded from this. 
so the stimulation was, was just a standard antagonist protocol nothing particularly unusual uh, the upon retrieval the cumulus ursite complexes were isolated and then the ursites were denuded of their cumulus cells by uh, a mechanical methodology in hyaluronidase so just pipetting them up and down in that uh, and of course once the cumulus cells are removed you can now see under the microscope whether the egg is mature or not so they were at that point classified as either immature so germinal vesicle or meiosis one or mature meiosis two eggs the mature oocytes from the study were randomly selected from the available pool. These were um, donors that were producing eggs that were, would be used for some patients. And so it was only uh, eggs that were considered surplus uh, that were used. Uh, so a good number of eggs had to be produced, uh, but uh, they were then randomly selected. So there's nothing. Um, these eggs should be very representative of what you would normally have when you have a mature egg. Uh, the immature eggs were randomized into two groups. One group would receive culture with cumulus cells added and the other without. Uh, they were cultured in GEMS media and uh, about uh, five microliters of uh, 20 uh, million um, cells per milliliter of cumulus cells uh, were added. Uh, the culture was then done up until the metaphase two stage uh, or um, up to 50 hours in case nothing happened in a time lapse incubator. At that point, the zona pellucida and the polar bodies were removed and the egg was placed into a, a separate test tube. Whole genome amplification was carried out and then next generation sequencing to assess the chromosome copy number. Uh, this just gives you the numbers that were in each group. You can see it's a reasonably sized study, uh, over 100 uh, mature eggs that were tested, uh, and then about 137 in each of the groups for the uh, immature, either with or without cumulus cells. When we looked at the maturation rate, so moving into the results now, we saw no statistical difference between uh, the proportion that matured either with or without cumulus cells. Uh, you could argue that a slightly larger study might see a difference here. The difference is uh, less than 10%, however, um, and certainly adding the cumulus cells does not seem to have improved uh, the maturation rate in this study. So no evidence for an improved maturation rate associated with cumulus cell co-culture in this study. We did note that, not surprisingly, 60% uh, of GV oocytes successfully matured, but th this was better with meiosis 1 oocytes. 88% of those did mature. Of course, that's a very significant difference uh, and, of course, not surprising. If we think about the cytogenetic analyses, uh, let me just quickly remind you, of course, the situation we have in an oocyte at... Um, meiosis uh, in a mature M2 oocyte. Uh, so of course you have the two homologous chromosomes, two copies of each chromosome, and they have both replicated their DNA. So they're composed of two chromatids. And what should happen if all goes well is that one of those should remain in the oocyte and the other one should pass into the first polar body. And then of course on meiosis two, you get separation of the chromatids and one of those goes into the second polar body leaving the egg haploid. So that's what would happen in a normal situation. Here's just an example of some of the results that we got. Uh, this is uh, just showing you a next generation sequencing plot. It's showing you a measurement of the amount of the relative amount of DNA from each chromosome. Uh, and you can see that each chromosome is tested at multiple individual points along its length. And what you can see here is that most of the chromosomes are along this central line. That means they have the normal expected number of copies. But you can see that chromosome number one here, all of the places where it's been tested are very high. This suggests that it's actually got this situation here where it actually has both of the chromosomes still present. So all four chromatids are present. Uh, testing the polar body from this egg shows indeed that it has no copies of chromosome one at all. So they've all been retained in the egg. So this is a chromosome abnormality uh, due to a non-disjunction. 
Uh, you can also see a chromatid abnormality sometimes, and, and this is a situation where two of the chromatids separate prematurely. I should just remember this shouldn't happen until meiosis too. And one of them gets retained with the egg, uh, and the other one passes into the polar body, or it could go the other way around as well. And you can see an example of that here. There's a chromatid gain affecting chromosome 22 in the egg. You can see it doesn't go as high up as in the previous example. That's because you've got three copies here rather than in the previous example, four. And in the corresponding polar body, you can see that it has one copy less than it should. So this is just giving you an idea of what those sorts of results look like. Uh, in summary, this is what we found. About 81% of the mature oocytes were chromosomally normal. Uh, a similar number, 76% of those that were in vitro matured with cumulus cells um, were chromosomally normal. And again, a similar number, 84% roughly of uh, those uh, eggs matured without cumulus cells were chromosomally normal. So again, no difference was observed. Um, it tells us that the in vitro matured eggs did not have a higher aneuploidy rate uh, than those that were mature at the time of retrieval. Um, we also saw, saw that the presence of cumulus cells did not seem to improve the aneuploidy rate further, um, maybe not surprising given that uh, there were no differences between the IVM and the ones that were mature anyway. We did see some subtle difference if we really burrowed into the cytogenetic data. We noticed that a small number uh, of the IVM oocytes had what we call complex aneuploidy. This means that three or more chromosomes were aneuploid in a single egg. That wasn't seen at all in uh, the eggs that were mature at the time of retrieval. Um, and in fact, uh, when we've looked in embryos and eggs in the past of young patients like these young donors, it's very, very unusual to see complex aneuploidy. Uh, and so the fact that we saw it at all is perhaps interesting. Uh, it suggests that maybe some eggs that undergo the in vitro maturation process are kind of pushed to a threshold where they behave more like eggs from older patients and become sensitive to problems that can then lead them to have uh, these multiple aneuploidies. However, I don't know that that's going to be very clinically relevant given its rarity. Looking at the individual chromosomes, we were looking at um, around about 2,000 chromosomes uh, from each of these groups. Uh, and so that gave us the st statistical power to look at, uh, as well at quite small variations. And we did note that the instance of chromatid abnormalities uh, were actually slightly higher uh, in the in vitro matured eggs cultured with cumulus cells, uh, and whole chromosome abnormalities were slightly higher in uh, the in vitro matured eggs without cumulus cells. So both of them having a small increase in the risks of aneuploidy, but really quite small. And so probably not of great clinical uh, importance. One of the interesting things this study did give us was an overview of the aneuploidies seen in the sort of patients that we don't often test. And in fact, in their eggs moreover, rather than in their embryos. And so uh, it's, it's not very uh, common to see the spread of aneuploidy uh, in eggs at, uh, in patients of this age. And one of the interesting things you see is that, yes, there's a bit of variation between chromosomes, but it's not that dramatic. Uh, whereas if you contrast this to what we would see if we looked at the chromosomes of older patients, you would see certain chromosomes become uh, much more um, have a much greater risk of aneuploidy as patients age. You can think chromosomes 21, 22, 16. Uh, you would see those going very high, whereas you can see the spread is much more even here. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so considering the strengths of the study, well, it's a prospective study. We had randomization. And a good number, I think, of eggs from young, healthy donors, a, a group of patients or a group of individuals that we don't often get data from. Additionally, time-lapse monitoring was used. Uh, now, I'm not reporting any kind of kinetic data here, but of course, that 
is potentially helpful in that the eggs did not have to come in and out of the incubators uh, on several occasions to be monitored. As far as limitations go, I think probably one of the most important ones is that the cumulus cells were stripped away from the eggs and then they were simply put back in the culture media with the eggs. It seems very unlikely to me that they were able to reestablish the transzonal processes that are so important in maintaining their um, association with the egg, in communicating and supplying the egg uh, with raw materials. So while the cumulus cells may have been able uh, to um, produce factors into the, the media, uh, they would certainly have lost some of that really intimate communication that they had with the egg before. We also don't have any information about the viability of the eggs that did mature and turn out to be chromosomally normal. We don't know if they would have fertilized uh, or produced uh, embryos that developed appropriately. And of course, we don't know whether those would have led to live births of healthy children. So what about future studies? I, I think really this study gives us a nice first step into this, but really there are many questions that remain to be answered. For, to begin with, are the chromosomally normal embryos that were produced, um, do they have similar levels of things like mosaicism and segmental aneuploidy, bits of chromosomes lost or duplicated? Um, compared to eggs which are mature at the time of retrieval. We know that things like mosaicism, of course, begins to happen after fertilization. It happens in those early mitotic divisions uh, when the egg is really guiding the embryo forward. Uh, similarly, with segmental aneuploidy, many of those arise during those early mitotic divisions. So does the IBM process have any impact on those kinds of abnormality. Uh, is there normal fertilization? Is the embryo development normal and appropriate? Can you get viable pregnancies from this? And do does having cumulus cells present make a difference to these kinds of outcomes? This has not been looked at. Um, is the health of the children born after rescue IVM the same as it is for other IVF kids? Can immature eggs be identified without the removal of cumulus cells. I've told you how disruptive it is to remove the cumulus cells and, and how you can probably never really put them back in the same way that they were there originally. So can we find ways where we could identify whether an egg is mature or not without removing its associated cumulus cells? Because then this whole process, this whole concept might be um, a lot more potent in terms of what it could do for the egg. Would co-culture with greater concentrations of cumulus cells have an effect? Ultimately, we were only adding about 100,000 cumulus cells into the culture media, but the culture media is 20 microliters uh, at droplet. And so they're relatively dilute within there. And so again, it raises the question of, you know, are they able to have a great enough effect on the egg if they're not close enough to it or if there aren't enough of them? What about application to older age groups? Of course, we, we looked at a really sort of very specific population here, the young fertile donors. But what about the older IVF patients? I, I mentioned how we saw some chromosome abnormalities in a subset of the in vitro matured eggs, which were a little bit reminiscent of what we see in the older patients, things like multiple aneuploid chromosomes, which are otherwise almost unheard of in younger patients. Uh, so maybe the older patient groups would be more sensitive uh, in their in immature eggs to them developing these sorts of problems. And so maybe things like uh, cumulus cells could have a greater impact for them. Ultimately, what we seem to be seeing here is that there's not a problem with chromosome segregation, at least not a big problem with chromosome segregation when you do in vitro maturation the eggs tend to end up being chromosomally normal in line with the age of your patient, but they still don't seem to do as well. So is it a cytoplasmic problem rather than a nuclear problem? Uh, and if so, what could we do about that? Could we consider things that might enhance the cytoplasm like myotic spindle transfer 
uh, or other approaches of that kind. So just to summarize on the key messages, uh, when we cultured immature oocytes until they reached the meiosis II stage, until they were mature, we didn't see an increase in the proportion of chromosome abnormalities uh, in comparison with those eggs that were mature at the time of retrieval. So from a cytogenetic, a chromosomal perspective, uh, the results of this study suggest that we probably shouldn't be discarding immature oocytes. Uh, at least from that chromosomal perspective, they seem to be okay and could be considered uh, for actual clinical use. Of course, if you have a, a young patient, that may never become something you need to do. But for an older patient with very few eggs to begin with um, and high aneuploidy rates, it, it may be something that would have merit. Uh, we didn't see any improvement in the outcomes after adding autologous cumulus cells, cumulus cells from the same patient. Um, but uh, I think we maybe haven't completely answered uh, whether that could work in some instances. Uh, so just, of course, to acknowledge all the people involved in the study, um, I was only involved in the genetic part myself, but there was a, the wonderful embryology team from uh, EV Barcelona that did a lot of work on this. So thanks very much for listening. If I'm able to answer any of your questions, I'll be very happy to try. Thank you so much, Dega, for a wonderful uh, presentation and almost like a, a class on, on in vitro maturation. There are plenty <laughs> of questions that we will be discussing later at the Q&A time, but uh, before we move on, and just for clarity, for these more than 600 people that are connected today, colleagues and friends, uh, here we are discussing rescue IVM, right, rather than proper immature eggs that you retrieve without stimulation. That's correct, yes. So uh, the, these eggs were not uh, retrieved with the idea that they would be immature uh, and then subjected to very special approaches to try and mature them. These were ones where they were discovered to be immature in a cycle where the hope had been that they would be mature. Uh, so yes, that's right. It's, it's rescue IVM that we're talking about here. Wonderful, extremely interesting. So we will uh, get back to the questions when we... Um present the next speaker. Thank you, Dagan. Oh, my pleasure. I have uh, the great pleasure now to introduce um, our final speaker tonight is uh, Duncan Nicholas. Um, Duncan, uh, as, as you may know, he uh, works for RBMO. He's our journal editor development consultant, and he currently has an extensive role within our journal. Uh, he's extremely busy organizing so many things, making the journal bigger, organizing meetings like this one, taking care of social network and Twitter, Instagram, RBMO Insights, and, and so many other things that uh, you're familiar with. Um, it's a tremendous help for, for the growth of the journal. Duncan has uh, nearly 20 years experience in the journal publishing industry, working with major corporate publishers, independent academic journals and society publishers. And he's going to share his knowledge about submitting a manuscript. I think his presentation is going to be extremely useful, uh, very especially for the, for the junior people listening to us tonight. So Duncan, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Juan. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Welcome everyone. <clears throat> uh, I am going to speak to you today about publishing tips. We thought we would use these journal webinars to uh, help to um, provide some behind the scenes information and advice on journal publishing. So this will be the first of a series of four uh, presentations, or at least this year anyway, um, over our quarterly webinar series. So. The first session today will be preparation and submission. Uh, and then the next RBMO live event in June, we will talk about peer review, revision and rejection. And then uh, in September, I'll talk about acceptance and what comes next after your papers have been accepted. And then uh, at the end of the year, December, quite a long while to wait, but no doubt it will be here very soon. Um, I will talk about advanced author skills and lots of peripheral tools and techniques um, that can be extremely useful um, as an author, as a researcher for completing that kind of 
loop, feedback loop of a uh, publishing cycle of creating research and having it feedback into your own research and understanding things like metrics, open science, open access, data sharing, um, author services that are out there for you, um, and things like that. And all of this, I am going to, uh, we are going to discuss in the context of high impact publishing, uh, which Nick mentioned in his introduction at the start of the session today. Um, so you may have heard the phrase high impact publishing around, but what exactly do we, or at least me in this context, mean by that? Um, I mean the status of the journal that you want to get your paper published in. That's often the most common understanding of high impact publishing, but also the impression that you want your work to make on the editors and reviewers when you first submit your paper. Of course, you want your paper to make a big impact on the very first people that read it because you want it to be accepted. And then, of course, the effect that your work has on readers and your field. So you want people to read it, of course, and you want it to inform their work as well. So that in turn is what creates the impact in the journals that you want to get into. So this series of presentations are going to help you make your research as impactful as possible. Um, as well as these webinars, uh, Nick also mentioned, and Juan in his introduction, um, thanks for mentioning these, Juan, the Insights um, monthly uh, newsletter that we produce with RBMO. So we include regular publishing tips and information, um, about the journal and about the publishing industry that could help you as an author um, every month in the insights. And these are available through LinkedIn in a LinkedIn newsletter and uh, an email version um, of the same, um, which you can find if you search, search us up. Um, so to today, publishing tips, episode one, preparation and submission. So the fundamentals is where we start for high impact publishing before you even conduct your research. You need to ensure uh, your foundations, procedural and methodological plans and statistical techniques are all sound, uh, robust and relevant. Then when you come to write up your paper, you just need to write what you did and why. Um, that's an overly simplistic statement perhaps, but it's not too far from the truth really. Um, once you have, if all of your, your fundamentals and foundations are in place, thorough with note taking throughout the whole process, the actual paper writing is just collecting all of that information together. So the first questions to ask that a reader might ask about the paper are connected with the problem or issues being investigated. There should be a clear statement near the beginning of the paper uh, explaining fundamental problems that the paper seeks to resolve. Um, authors often leave this until around halfway through the paper, or maybe they don't even mention it at all. It's surprisingly overlooked part um, of research papers to never assume that it's self-evident or obvious from um, the method or the design or any other features of your paper. State it very clearly. Be assertive with the purpose of the paper and consider uh, that a reader with less expert knowledge of the work only has your paper to go on, to build up the foundations of where the research comes from, why you're doing it, and where it's going, all in your one manuscript. The theoretical framework and uh, methodology must be clearly described and drawn from previous work to a kind of reference your paper in regards to current knowledge that's already known. Your data collection must be rigorous and your statistical analysis relevant to answering your questions. Again, based on accepted practices, established methodologies, building on previous work to position your paper against existing knowledge. The new material that you add to the literature can be compared and contrasted and build on what's already known. So ask yourself these questions about your work. 
Have I done something new and interesting? Is there anything challenging in my work that challenges stale conventions, perhaps? Is my research directly related to new current hot topics? Or have you provided solutions to some difficult problems? You don't necessarily need to have mind-blowing, world-changing responses to each of these. But if you can think about these and justify your paper's role in answering at least one of them, uh, one of these characteristics, then you're on the right track for the journal editors of these high impact journals to be interested because these are the kinds of characteristics that they're looking for in a research papers that they want to publish in their journals. All of this can be summed up in the adage, is it new? Is it true? Does it matter? So that's something to remind yourself or to just question constantly about your paper. Have you made these aspects of it obvious without overstating them um, in, a, uh, in a way which is not founded with the research that you've conducted? Why publish in journals? If we think about this, this can give you some other context for your work. And the papers that you are writing or that you could write in future can help you focus the writing of those um, and which papers that you would write. So journals give your work visibility. That's one of the reasons why you would choose a certain journal. So you can help others learn, help the right people learn, the right readers. So you have to choose the right audience, um, uh, which in turn means you should choose the right journal. Involve you in the topic discussion. Um, and the subject community adds also not just to um, the subject area experts, but to the public as well, public understanding and discourse of topics. Also to prevent waste and needless repetition of research. Um, so you get your research in first, get it recognized, get people to reference you first so they don't repeat unnecessarily the same work. Um, in, ensure the permanence of knowledge as well. Good journals will ensure that work is perpetually available online. You also might be required to produce papers um, published by your employers uh, for PhDs or assessment committees. And some of those requirements may require you to publish in specific journals, which brings us back to the high impact, highly ranked, high status versions of journals, which is the context and we're talking. Um, and it just so happens that RBMO is one of those high status, high impact journals. So by attending this webinar tonight, um, you've already heard from two authors who have been discussing the type of work that fulfills the criteria that I've been talking about over the last few slides. And by attending this webinar, reading, responding to papers in the journal, you're starting to become part of the community at this level of publishing. So hold those thoughts of community for a second, because I will come back, or for a few months actually, I will come back to them in a future edition of this Publishing Tips series. But today, I want to keep it focused on getting your papers submitted. So, how to get past the first hurdles of submission. The instructions for authors and aims and scope are the most common reasons why papers are rejected from journals, particularly when you're focused at high impact top ranking journals that receive many, many hundreds, even thousands of submissions, but they still may only manage to publish a couple of hundred, few hundred papers a year. So they must manage their workload in some way and not overburden the, the editors of the journal or the reviewers of which I'm sure you are aware there is a, a finite pool of in the world and you all only have so much capacity for reviewing and working on so many papers in addition to your own. So lots of journals reject lots of papers and to do that they immediately reject papers that don't properly fit within the aims and scope of the journal. Very close behind that, papers that don't comply with instructions for authors. 
These two things are somewhat intertwined when making lists of potential journals for your work. The scope and topic might come first. Does the area uh, that the journal covers match the area for your research? Again, you might be surprised at the number of authors who mismatch this quite significantly. The biggest, most busiest journals say the, the Lancet and Nature reject 90, 95% of the papers that they receive. The majority of those are immediately rejected because they don't match their very strict, often novelty and you know, progressiveness of research for the reasons there. So the aims and scope is the first one. Does the topic match? And then um, there are the technical checks in the instructions for authors, the structure of the papers, things like word length um, or structure of the studies. That's the that's the second kind of hurdle that you need to get through. Um, and then once you've got past that, paper will be sent to the editor to check and it'll be back to the aims and scope for the editor to check whether uh, your paper does meet um, the aims and scope correctly. And that's where you find out that whether you have interpreted the aims and scope um, appropriately. So let's have a look at those in more detail. Here we have RBMOs, aims and scope, international journal, is a global journal with a global audience and also it will publish articles from anywhere in the world as well based on any population um, in any country around the world so long as it that research is focused on biomedical research on human conception and the welfare of the human embryo and here are some of our uh, partner societies for whom we are the official journal of and here is the uh, PGDIS as well mentioned here of which Dagan Wells is president. So conception and the growth um, of embryos relevant to humans is the broad aims and scope of RBMO. And let's have a look at the types of issues that will result in an immediate rejection from RBMO. So papers that cover general gynecology or obstetrics, um, they do not do not fall within the scope of RBMO. Fundamental basic science, animal fertility in isolation that has no relation or comparison or contrasting relevance to human reproduction. The uh, papers that um, we receive uh, with issues of concept and methodology, they might have inadequate sample sizes um, with very low powered, incoherent methodology, a lack of controls in the study, a lack of reproductive outcomes, so nothing that conforms to that, that core basic aims and scope, um, clear data trawling or phishing, um, p-hacking, harking, if you've heard of those terms, um, or any evidence of fraud, of course, will be um, immediately rejected. And quality and contributions are also another reason for um, immediate rejection, where the level of writing is insufficient to be understood. The paper is not uh, is not very scientific or not based in the scientific method or has poorly substantiated claims. The foundations um, of the research are um, kind of unstable, not clear, don't look very robust. Um, a lack of ethical board approval and repetitive or marginal additions to knowledge. So just incremental incremental additions to knowledge um, often rejected as well. Although it should be noted also that RBMO is a very progressive journal um, and that's one of its core kind of principles that it was founded on by um, Bob Edwards. So we are interested in papers that do propose novel, intriguing new lines of research that may not be well powered, may have small sample sizes because uh, the problems are in such niche communities. 
um, or the, the methods are kind of exploratory and new, but the rest of the, um, the foundations of the paper are very robust and it's referenced in the right kind of structured way that it is still of very high quality. So uh, there is still scope for um, some kind of very niche research, of course. Now let's uh, have a look at the instructions for authors in a little more detail. Uh, here's the RBMO site. I go to four authors. We can have a look at uh, down the side here are all uh, possibly some daunting, possibly some overwhelming list of kind of details characteristics of the paper. So we have here um, more details on the very specific uh, topics that the journal will cover within its broad aims and scope. The eight sections, eight different sections of the journal, uh, the topics that are covered within those. And the structure of the different types of paper that the journal will consider, full length articles, what they're comprised of, short communications, what they're comprised of as well. Um, so very granular details of how to structure your paper, which other than being maybe looking quite daunting list of instructions, also helps you and do, does half of the work for you in writing your paper, steering how you should structure, how you can construct your paper. And all of the kind of ethical documentation that you will need um, to be able to pass those instructions for authors hurdles to get past um, uh, those to make sure all of the ethical procedures are in place. Declarations of interest, conflicting, competing interest statements are in order. Um, informed consent and patient details. Disclosure of instructions. Uh, authorship is all in order. All of these things will need to be provided when you submit your paper. And then there's the preparation of the article itself, the article structure, the structured things like structured abstract, providing the introduction, methods, results, discussion, appendices in that order. So your submissions must comply with these requirements or they'll be returned to you to amend. Um, there is some debate um, in the publishing industry, perpetual debate about the requirements of structuring submissions because it can be uh, quite tedious for authors to um, keep changing the structure and the format of the paper between submitting to different journals. But uh, Hopefully this this presentation uh, and the rest of them over the course of this series um, will help you to get the first choice journal right the first time to reduce the amount of time you have to uh, spend amending your papers to submit them. But also this structure really does help um, the editors and the reviewers to be able to provide feedback faster because they know where to look for the introduction and the, say, the, the references and method, they will always be in the same place um, in the paper for the same journal. Um, they will always be in the same format and it reduces some of the burden of reviewing to be able for, to make it easier for people to see and know what to expect from the structure of the paper. So that's, that's part of the reason why lots of journals are very particular about structuring articles. So it is important. Um, and now, speaking of submitting, uh, let's show you a little behind the scenes for those of you who may not have submitted to RBMO or indeed any journals. Here's the author login. There's the RBMO screen. I'll just click past that. So here again in the RBMO submission panel, we have again some more, more guidance on how to submit preparing your submission, preparing your revisions, um, which I'll come back to in the next webinar. 
So we want to submit a new manuscript. Choose your choose your article type um, here. Uh, browse, drag and drop, drop all your files. Um, put a test paper in here. Proceed to the next screen. I'm going to click through this relatively quickly just to give you an idea of what it looks like for those of you who may never have seen. Uh, choose the section that you feel your paper is most appropriate for. But sometimes we do change these um, as maybe the paper develops or if it isn't in quite the same, uh, quite the right section for ultimately how the paper ends up. Suggested reviewers. Lots of journals, again, uh, like to ask for reviewers. Um, as I very briefly mentioned, and we'll get into more detail in the next session, um, finding reviewers is very tricky. There's a lot of overburden for the work of the reviewer pool around the world for journals. So suggestions of reviewers are welcome, even if they aren't necessarily used. And here we get to see lots of the questions uh, that you are asked to confirm um, who's who's funded and supported the research declarations of that all the authors have confirmed they're happy with the work data sharing which i'll get to in the advanced author tips um but it's be becoming much more very widespread of journals requesting um that authors at least have the potential to share the data on which the paper is based. Um, if not to publish it alongside the article and make it available, at least in case the reviewers or the editor need to check it as part of the review process, you may be asked to provide the data um, for the paper. So that's something very significant worth um, bear in mind. Um, space for cover letter, again, something of a debatable issue of how valuable cover letters are. I like them. I think it's a good chance for you to convey the relevance of your paper to the journal um, and the value that the paper will have to the readers. And then the basic information about the paper, title, abstract, keywords, authors. Um, now, if you actually use a real, pa a real paper and not just a test one, um, this will actually pull out lots of the, the headings um, and put them all in for you to make it easy. And that's it. Then you click build PDF for approval and it will approve your paper. And then your paper will be with the editorial office and our um, editorial team will check files to make sure everything is in order you've provided everything um, the ethical approvals any supplementary materials things like that send it to the editors um, for them to check um, whether they feel it's suitable for reviewing in the journal and if so send it to review and with any luck um, you will get a positive response and on the subject of high impact publishing and quality um, just because it is very hot off the press, uh, published this week in our uh, Impress articles, a group of authors, including um, our editor, who's here tonight, Juan Garcia Velasco, have published an article on high impact journal publishing about being very critical of published articles even to keep an eye for flaws that might make it past reviewers which is something I'll be talking about in the next webinar in this series. But yeah, this paper is some homework before our next webinar in three months time on the, the fine details of published research. So this session will be back for part two of this publishing tip series. We'll be looking at peer review, revision and rejection, what to do if your paper is rejected. Um, and we'll be back um, for the eighth episode of RBMO Live on the 11th of June. And with that, I shall return to Nick. Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, uh, unusual, I think, for people to be able to hear 
um, a, a, such a description of the process. And I hope people have found that very helpful. I, I am aware that many people joining us this evening are very seasoned publishers and reviewers and section editors. Um, but um, for those who, who are coming into publishing, I hope that you found this very helpful. And as Duncan says, there'll be uh, more to learn from him in the, in the coming months. So we've had our three uh, presentations now, and um, I, I've been delighted to see the, the, the amount of questions coming in. We're not going to be able to handle all of them, I'm afraid, um, but we'll try and get through as many as we can. And um, I'm going to ask the, 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 all the speakers to, to reconnect um, if they can. Um, and um, I think I'd like to go to Dagan first, uh, Dagan. Um, we, 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 we got a lot of questions on, on your work. I, I, I'm aware you're not a, a sort of a, a daily embryologist, so I'm, I'm going to try and curate the questions a little bit. N not even monthly or yearly. Not even monthly, no. Well, having said that, I think there is, there is I think, a question I'd like to put to you from Alistair McClure in the UK, because I think... In, in, in what he was suggesting is, you know, he's asking to what extent the oocytes that you looked at reflect those which tend to be rescued. Are they mm -hmm. coming from rescues? And he is, to, to quote him, he says, these are young, optimal patients in your study. Um, the IVM that he's been involved with is tem tend not to be. Yeah. Um, the clinics tend to apply IVM to cases where there are very few M2 oocytes at stripping for ICSI. And these cases are tend to be poor prognosis. Do you think, I mean, given the findings, even though they're from perhaps a more optimal patient population, do you think you, you, you're you confident enough about the understanding you've gained of the biology that it's likely that even in these less good prognostic patients, the, the same findings might be found? I think they might be, but I would hesitate to say that we can extrapolate from this data to say they definitely would be. Um, as I mentioned, there's a just a slight hint that maybe things are not quite as as good with the in vitro matured in terms of their chromosomal status. We saw just a very low number of ones uh, of eggs that seemed like there'd been a collapse in the normal mechanisms of chromosome segregation, and they'd become very aneuploid. Now, it didn't raise a big alarm, though, because they were very few. But it makes you think that if you see that kind of phenomenon in a very optimal group of eggs from young fertile donors, what on earth will you see when the, the whole, all the systems are a little bit more under stress and not performing as well as you might do in, in a much older patient? So I, I think it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, and I think we won't really know until we explore it properly. Thank you. I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the implications for your of your work um, in perhaps good prognostic patients is within the very burning field of oocyte freezing for fertility preservation, where I think that probably most centers at the moment are only storing mm. mature eggs. Do you think that is something we should be revisiting? Because, I, you know, from personal experience, I know it can be a very disappointing conversation with women when perhaps they've got a good few eggs or maybe sort of eight or nine, but only three or four mature. Yeah. Where, where do you think we'll be heading with that? Well, I, I think there would be an argument, of course, for freezing those uh, immature eggs at the moment, uh, just simply because who knows how good we're going to get at in vitro maturation in the future. So uh, people who are uh, freezing for reasons of fertility preservation I mean, they might not want those eggs for another decade and things may have moved on dramatically in that time. Let's hope that maybe they have it, I think the key thing though would be in managing the patient's expectations. I mean, if they've got you know, three mature eggs and seven immature, okay, we can freeze those seven and in 10 years, maybe everything works beautifully, but then again, maybe it doesn't. So yeah. I think you just have to be very careful that they don't, read too much into the potential of those eggs which yeah. maybe never will have so perhaps it shouldn't be changing the way we counsel patients on the number of mature eggs they might wish to get into the freezer to give themselves a good chance right we might want to internally revisit with what we do with the immature eggs and perhaps uh, talk about storing them um yeah. most of the thing, most of the questions that came in i, I did have an embryology slant but uh, i can couple, give them a go but i don't, yes no problem one of the questions was what, what the time or time interval was between oocyte retrieval and denudation that um, was two like, hours in this study hours. right yeah. so that was that was pretty 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 steady um 
there's also the discussion around about you know um, cytoplasmic and you know uh, nuclear uh, maturation. Is there any evidence, Dagan, that uh, the cytoplasmic maturation in these circumstances might mirror what we're seeing? So, in other words, if we're getting reassuring data from your study on the euploidy status of immature oocytes. Um, is, can we can we extrapolate that extrapolate that in any degree to the cytoplasmic story? Yeah, I, I sort of think probably not. Uh, the the obviously the two things are happening in tandem, but they also seem to have a, a fair degree of independence from each other. So, it, I mean, the data from this study suggests that the nuclear part of the maturation goes pretty well, uh, at least in these very good quality eggs. But we know that if these sorts of eggs are, are used, then clinically the results aren't as good. Uh, and of course, a lot of that data does come from poorer quality material from older patients. But we, even when we do get better uh, quality, younger eggs for in vitro maturation, the, the outcomes still aren't as good. And so I, I think you have to, uh, I think the prime candidate for that is a cytoplasmic deficiency. Now, exactly what that is, whether it's something uh, mitochondrial, whether they're not quite adapted to uh, as they should be. Obviously, the mitochondria of an egg have quite a different morphology from what you see in some other cells. Maybe that's not right. Maybe there aren't enough proteins and energy sources and RNAs that have been built up there to allow the embryo to develop through those first few days. Yes. And um, you mentioned, I think, in your talk, obviously, that Juan sort of highlighted it, that you were talking about rescue IBM. Are, are there any studies that have looked at the euploidy status of in vitro matured oocytes that have been taken all the way through and haven't been exposed to gonadotropins in vivo? It, yeah, just very few, though. And um, numbers are, tend to be quite small and a little bit, uh, and the, uh, the picture is a bit mixed. So we, we've got some data on ones like that, uh, which is quite encouraging also, um, but that's not been the universal picture. Yeah. Okay. Again, it, 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 the, the, mud, the waters are a little bit muddied by differences in technology. And you know, some of these studies are a little bit older now. And certainly the genetic technologies have moved on and become a lot more accurate. So it may be worth revisiting those and getting some really hard data using modern methods. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm going to give you a, a break now. Thanks very much for that. Pleasure. Um, we, we got a lot of questions too for Greta's talk on the sperm uh, side of the story. Um, some very interesting ones. Um, we're, we're we're having problems connecting with Greta at the moment, and we're going to keep trying. But while we're while we're trying to see if we can get her back online, I thought I'd come back to Duncan. There's been a few questions for Duncan um, in in his role. Um, obviously. Um, I, I suppose I would start by saying that, look, RBMO is is not an easy journal to get into. Um, uh, it has a high rejection rate, but I think what I would emphasize in line with what Duncan said um, was that, is that many of these rejections that do happen very, very early on in the process. And if you can convince the editors who are making the initial assessment of your paper that it fits within the scope of the journal, has the quality, is addressing the need, you know, is it new, is it true, and does it matter? Um, and it gets sent for review, actually has a reasonable chance, if not getting accepted first time, of being uh, um, proposed for, for some changes. And once, once you get into that dialogue with referees, there is a good chance, as long as you really address the questions that are raised, um, that you might well get to an acceptance. So um, in that sense, I think the, the message that Duncan says is very important uh, in helping you to, to get into RBMO. Um, Duncan, we had, a, we had a couple of questions, um, an interesting one about AI. It is, it, it is everywhere and it's in, it's in um, publishing and it's causing, an, I suppose, some optimism and some concern. Uh, perhaps more of the latter, generally. Mm. And one of the questions that um, one of the listeners asked was, how much AI do you think it's reasonable for writers to use when they're preparing a paper? 
Um, this yes. is something we have discussed internally and was the subject of a recent editorial for Juan and me, but I'm interested in what your advice would be on that. Um, uh, I think the, the phrase kind of how much is quite a good way of asking it because I would say in the general advice from uh, lots of journals that have produced advice, I mean, the, the advice across journals is very inconsistent. Um, some journals are placing an outright ban on anyone that uses AI text generation, which will be incredibly difficult for them to police. Maybe not so much now, but probably in two months time, it will be really hard for anyone to tell what was perhaps generated or not. But the important thing is that the work that you submit to the journal is coherent and makes sense and that you will accept responsibility for the content of the paper and that the submitted article says what you want it to say um, without plagiarizing anyone else's work um, or saying things which just aren't true. I think that's the, the problem, the dangers with AI are people using it to produce huge parts of the manuscript unchecked and just doing all the writing of the paper for them and um, the authors not checking what those words actually are and it adding in untruths uh, like spurious statements about things yeah. fabricated references fabricated data um, just nonsense which it's no good to be published, it just wastes the reviewers and the editor's time and it's not what you want your paper to be. Yeah, no, I think, I think, I think that's very helpful and it, it, certainly AI is something that is going to be part of this process, but we just need to watch that the, the work remains original and um, is, uh, the, the authors take responsibility for it. So thank you, thank you very much for that, Duncan. Um, I think I would add, I would yeah. add about images as well, yeah. because yeah. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with the Frontiers paper with the rat uh, diagram that went around perhaps last month. Um, that was a very extreme example of using um, image generation to produce your figures for you. Um, mm. which is an incredibly bad idea because text generation is quite far ahead of image generation in being um, more nuanced and more yeah. successful at producing be better results. Um, yeah. I, I would just advise against yes, using that, image okay. generation for that, anything in manuscript. I think, um, you know, as far as possible, do stick to the old fashioned way, I think is probably the message uh, at the moment. Um, thank you very much for that. I, um, we, I'm afraid we haven't been able to reconnect with Greta. So I'm sorry to all of you who sent in such interesting uh, questions to her, but that's sometimes the, the downside of this uh, type of uh, platform, but uh, we're, we're a little bit dependent on that. But I, I would like to take the opportunity, thanking you all for joining us this evening and thanking uh, all our speakers uh, for preparing the, the the papers that they presented to us. Um, and uh, I'd also like to thank the i3 team who have been really fantastic in helping us get this together and, uh, and reach out to you this evening. Um, so the organizing committee, uh, names who are, I think, increasingly very well known to you, Jacques Cohen, Peter Nagy, uh, Marianne uh, Savates, Thomas Elliott, Fran Farley, Giles Palmer and Violet Sura. Thank you for that. And um, of course, there's a. This is part of a big series. Our next one, as Duncan said, is going to be on the 11th of June. So please do join us. And remember that uh, I3 has an ongoing series of of these webinars. Uh, the next one's on the 26th of March, and it's all going to be all about managing the minefield of cryo storage consents posthumous use of samples, disputed and unclaimed so Yes, we, we, we all hear about these problems, haven't we? And they're going to be discussed by leading lawyers and embryologists. So we are um, encouraged not to miss it. So once again, from Juan and from me, uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight, uh, spending some time with RBMO. It's been our pleasure to do that with you. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. 
Yeah, thanks, Nick. Thanks, everyone. Fantastic audience. Thank you.